All right. It is a time for our last panel, and it is uh, a mixed panel. Our committee members for this panel are the Honorable Mitch Goldberg, uh, Catherine Rowe, Neil McBride, and Dr. Robert Rucker. Our panel participants are Judge Orlando Garcia from the Western District of Texas, uh, the U.S. Attorney Richard Durbin from the Western District of Texas, the panel rep John Combrey from the Western District of Texas, and the panel rep from uh, D uh, District of Arizona, Mr. David Eisenberg. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll start with you, J uh, Judge Garcia, if you'd like to make an opening statement. Okay. Yes, thank you, Judge Cardone, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and the commission, and thank you for the leadership you have shown thus far, and I know you will continue in this important area of concern. As a judge of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, I am honored to serve in one of the largest and most diverse districts in the United States. Our district is the second largest in the country, encompassing 68 counties and 92,000 square miles. It is the only district to stretch over two time zones. It is known as a border court with more than 800 miles of international boundary with Mexico. And one of the largest border cities in the nation is El Paso, Texas. But border court doesn't begin to describe our district. In addition to two large divisions on the border, El Paso and Del Rio, we also have divisions in San Antonio, Austin, Waco, and Midland, Odessa. Four major metro metropolitan areas that are many hundreds of miles inside the United States. These metropolitan areas present all the challenges and complexities faced by other urban courts around the country. The Western District's criminal docket is like the district itself, large and diverse. It is similarly belies the border court stereotype. According to the most recent published statistics from the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, the Western District is the busiest in the nation, prosecuting more felony defendants than any other district in the country. These prosecutions included a large number of immigration offenses, but that is not the all they include. For example, in calendar year 2014, our district was the second in the nation in the number of defendants prosecuted for fraud second in the nation for federal sex offenses, and second in the nation for firearm and explosive offenses. Given our district's extremely busy and extremely varied criminal docket, it's little wonder that we face a wide range of challenges in ensuring adequate defense for indigent defendants. Appointed lawyers in the smaller, more remote divisions like Pecos, Texas, serve an undersized CJA panels overburdened with cases and distant from needed resources and training in major urban centers like Austin or San Antonio face numerous complex cases with demanding needs for high cost services like investigations, investigators rather, and forensic experts. Large single dockets like in our Del Rio division with more than 1,700 defendants charged in 2014, stretch resources to their breaking point, placing additional pressures of time and docket management on appointed lawyers. And throughout the district, thousands of defendants are detained in remote facilities, have limited or no English speaking abilities, added dimensions that put even greater demands on defense counsel and the courts. In all these ways, the Western District of Texas demonstrates the diverse and extremely difficult challenges this commission must confront in making recommendations to reform the Criminal Justice Act and to improve the delivery of federal defense services to the indigent. In light of these diverse challenges, I encourage and urge the commission to avoid general one-size-fits-all prescriptions for reform. The challenges our system faces in meeting the requirements of the Sixth Amendment are complex, and they differ from district to district, and sometimes they differ from division to division within the district. The Commission must take these differences into account in making its recommendations, allowing for a variety of solutions to fit the needs of a variety of local situations. 
More importantly, I urge the Commission to focus on the pragmatic solutions to the problems our system faces. What our district needs most is access to adequate resources distributed fairly over a large region with our collected different challenges. If the Commission can make practical suggestions that help a district like ours, it will make a real difference in the defense of thousands of individuals. Meeting the constitutional requirement for indigent defense presents major challenges for our courts, both in the Western District and throughout our country. But however complex and varied the challenges, the goal remains the same, to ensure excellent representation for every defendant charged in federal court. I wish the Commission every success and in achieving this essential goal. Thank you, Judge Cardone. Mr. Jarvis. Good afternoon, Judge Cardone, distinguished members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Richard Durbin. I'm the United States Attorney for the Western District of Texas. I've served in that capacity uh, under appointments uh, since about uh, late December of last year. I've been an assistant U.S. Attorney in the district since 1983, and I've had a number of supervisory positions, as well as a position as a trial lawyer <clears throat> during that 32 years. Um, I've provided testimony to the committee. Uh, what I thought I would do with this, this opening is just sort of focus on a couple of areas informally. Um, uh, one is, as Judge Garcia has pointed out, uh, we are a wide-ranging district geographically. Uh, we have a number of different geographic regions within the district, and geography basically governs what we do. Uh, we're along the, the border with Mexico, which generates um, probably the, the large percentage of our cases. We do, according to our numbers, in fiscal, um, during fiscal year uh, 2015, we filed almost 5,400 felony indictments against over 6,300 defendants. In addition to that, we prosecuted somewhere around 14,000 immigration misdemeanors um, in seven different divisions, and as Judge Garcia said, in two different time zones. Uh, it's, but it's an interesting district because um, although the challenges are great, um, I think both our office, the Federal Public Defender's Office, the panel lawyers and the courts, and all the agencies that work with the courts have a can-do attitude. Um, and it's remarkable how much we can get done with the resources we have. But that's sort of the background. Uh, one of the observations I would make um, to, the, to the commission um, that's, that's not in my comments is I, I find I, I yearn for, for data, for information. And I don't know how much information is out there. I tried to glean some information about, for example, how many of our cases are handled by court-appointed counsel or the public defender's office. Um, the numbers aren't clear, but the best I can come up with is something like 80 percent of the cases, which is a large number of cases against independent, indigent defendants. Um, uh, I, would, I would be interested in knowing uh, what types of cases they serve, they, they're appointed in, um, the number of cases they do. And one of the things that has occurred to me in getting ready for this is a question about what is the typical cost of a voucher? I mean, I've, I've read the prior report. I've talked with Mr. Convery, with the judge, and with other lawyers in the district. And, and one of the questions I have is, uh, how, much, how much does this cost? What does a voucher cost? Is there sort of an average voucher cost? Um, one of the things that crosses my mind is, would, it, would, would there be some way to systematize that instead of making them itemized? take a look at the type of case that's involved. We do, 80% of our cases probably are immigration cases, and most of those are relatively straightforward cases. I won't say they're all simple, um, but they're, most of them are not complex. They involve relatively straightforward elements. Um, and and they, they take a certain amount of expertise, but once you've done them, you've, you, you know what, what the issues are, and if the issues arise, you can get to those. In most of them, they don't arise, and I bet you 98% of them plead guilty. Um, and so they move very quickly, they move very efficiently. And that's a, that's a large amount of what we do. Um, and I don't really have a sense of what the distribution is um, of assignments among panel attorneys. I, I can't give you a sense of whether or not that's a, that's a fair distribution. I can tell you what, what it appears like, it appears like it's, it's, there's, there's a number of competent lawyers that appear regularly. I mean, overall, I think my comments 
I mean, my testimony were that I think it works pretty well. I think it's a, it's a good system. We don't have problems with a lot of bad lawyers. Um, there's some tinkering probably that could be done. I'm not quite sure I understand how the screening and review process works for panel attorneys. Um, it seems to be a little bit different in every division. In one division, there is none at all. There, there is no plan in the Austin division. Um, yet the judges seem satisfied, and um, the lawyers in our office, for the most part, seem satisfied with the competence and effectiveness of the lawyers that are appointed and appear in the courts. Um, I've mentioned vouchers. Uh, with respect to the quality of representation, as I say, generally it's very good. Uh, we don't have problems. It seems that, in an almost organic fashion, if there are problem lawyers, they get worked out of the system. Um, it's a mystery to me. It's a black box. I've, I've had some of it explained to me, but they seem to get worked out of the system. And I don't think that we have an inordinate number of cases um, that get broken in some way or busted based on ineffective assistance of counsel. So I think that the representation is, is generally very good. I would say about the Federal Public Defender's Office um, that their re representation in the kinds of cases they're appointed to is absolutely outstanding. Um, they are some of the best lawyers in the courtroom consistently year after year. Uh, one area where we do experience some difficulties, and I know the courts experience some difficulties, is the availability of sufficient numbers of qualified counsel in some of the more remote divisions, especially Del Rio. Uh, Del Rio is a town on the border of about 35,000. It doesn't have a huge and enormous lawyer community, uh, but we have a lot of crime. We have a lot of crime that comes out of the drug cartels. We're very active these days. Uh, with the Losetas organization in that area. We also have a number of, of prison-based gangs that operate. We've had, within the last several months, we've had a series of indictments out of there involving 30 and 40 defendants, um, involving such gangs as the Latin Kings and the Mexican Mafia. And I understand that the courts have had difficulties finding sufficient number of local lawyers who are qualified on the panel um, to, to serve I mean, those kinds of cases, to, to the extent that we have even been informally asked to consider in some of those cases if we have venue in a different division, in, a, in, a, in an adjacent division, could we consider bringing indictments in those divisions, such as the San Antonio division, where we have a much deeper bench, as it were, among the panel attorneys. Uh, but those are, those are the main issues that, that I have seen that I, would, that I would call to your attention. I have a limited perspective because I don't deal with vouchers. We don't see them. Um, we don't vet the, the panel lawyers, and in many ways, I think that's good. Um, my, my experience is some AUSAs understand what defense lawyers do, and some AUSAs don't. Um, and I'm not sure that always their input would necessarily be um, independent or objective. Um, you'd need to come up with some way to figure out um, how to make sure you're getting <coughs> good reasoned and informed as opposed to some of us who get angry because we didn't like the motion that was filed against us last week, um, as well as the, the, uh, the possible appearance issues that arise from getting us too closely involved in deciding who should be practicing and who shouldn't be practicing. Um, those, are, those are what I'd call the, uh, the panel's attention to, and I look forward to answering your specific questions. Mr. Converse. I'm Judge Cardone, members of the committee. I'm John Convery. I practice in San Antonio, Texas with Hasdorf and Convery. Um, my law partner and I are both members of the panel. Uh, we'll be back in the trenches, if you will, tomorrow uh, doing cases in federal court. We also do state court work, and <clears throat> we also have a niche where we do military uh, work. We both have military backgrounds, and so we do court marshals and various admin boards and military courts. Um, I have been a member of the uh, Criminal Justice Section Council of the ABA as the at-large member years ago. I've been an assistant district attorney and an assistant United States attorney in the Western District of Texas, where I had the pleasure to work for, for Richard Durbin uh, in, the drug, in, the, in the drug unit. Uh, I have been the CJA panel rep in the Western District of Texas since, I believe, nine, 1998. Uh, we were blessed, and still are blessed, with a great public defender's office. Lucian Campbell was the federal public defender for, I want to say, 30 years, and just did a remarkable, outstanding job. Um, as you know, the system, I'm also, in, in terms of putting forth any 
conflict, although it's not conflict. I say that because I'm under contract with the Administrative Office for U.S. Courts as a member of the Defender Services Advisory Group. Um, they take uh, panel representatives who then become, I'm the representative for the Fifth Circuit. Um, and at, in that capacity, I sit with uh, Chip Friendsley and with uh, Catherine Rowe and Ruben Kahn on the Defender Services Advisory Group and have done so for quite some time. In my remarks, I think this is part of the road to independence. And I'm not exactly sure where that road is going to lead, but I'm absolutely positive that you have a historic opportunity uh, to have some serious input into the issues and problems surrounding the CJA program. Um, I liken it to maturity, that in the 60s when I was a child, this was a child, meaning that the Kennedy administration went to Congress after Johnson versus Serbs. We got lawyers in federal court. Instead of just pointing at the person in the, in the courtroom and saying, why don't you do this, Joe? We started this process. And think about it. For many years through the teen years, uh, the people at the Administrative Office for U.S. Courts, very competent, very professional people. Ted Litz, uh, Judy Moraska, Steve Ason, Dick Wolf, please have them testify. These were people who made it their business, their life, their professional obligation to get a public defender in each district. And what you saw yesterday in the panel of federal public defenders is the culmination of all those efforts. Outstandingly competent, professional people. And all along that way, they were supported by the bar and by the panel that red-headed stepchild, who even in that process perhaps did not get the attention it deserved. Then we turn around in the 90s and we have a professional, organized cadre, a flagship of the federal public defenders, and some thought is given, may maybe we should go beyond that and work on this hybrid system. All along, that independence tension has always existed. It has always existed. But we worked within it. Because as that tension existed, the Administrative Office for U.S. Court convinced the judges to begin the CJA panel representative program. So each chief judge appoints a panel representative in each district. Then we start getting together and having meetings, yearly meetings. What do we talk about? Well, I get there in, in uh, 1998. We talk about quality of representation. We talk about subjects that most people in their day-to-day -day activity don't really talk about. We talk about resources. We talk about voucher cutting. Okay? We talk about fees. At that time, for a long time, the major push of this system was to bring the fee structure out of the bargain basement and bring it up to at least an acceptable level. Keep in mind, if you drill down at the district level for much of this time, when I started practicing law, many lawyers still didn't put in vouchers. They did it as an act of just, well, I take retained cases, and I should help the courts. Uh, when I became the CJA panel rep in 98, there were still lawyers who were doing that on the panel. 1998, lawyers who just didn't even submit a voucher. Okay. That begins your collection of data problems. For those who are either academics or, Judge, I know you're data-oriented. Oh, my gosh. When I got to the DSAG, my colleagues here will tell you. And I said, where's the data on voucher cutting? Well, we don't collect any. Oh, my gosh. You don't collect any. I, for any of you who are in the system who deal with the administrative office for U.S. courts, they are the most statistically analytical data collecting organization that we have in the federal government. There's no good reason that they haven't collected the data that you would like to have, Judge. And I pointed that out to them and I pointed out to you, be critical, be very critical, because in my humble opinion, it's intentional. It's anecdotal by intent, and that's wrong. And it still proceeds today. We've set up now through the District of Nevada a system of e-vouchering that I was at the charrettes that they had in San Francisco eight years ago or more to begin the program. And they showed us what they were doing in Nevada. 
And we, panel members, said, well, how can you account for voucher cutting? Oh, no, the judges don't care about that. It's not designed to, it's designed to, to smooth the voucher process. Yes, but where can it show whether the person actually did the work and, and what was done? Oh, no, 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 it just doesn't do that. It still doesn't do that today as we sit here. And that's just wrong. So when you talk to judges, good judges say, I don't cut vouchers. I, don't, I can't imagine anybody cutting vouchers. And I don't know what the bad judges say, but they don't say it to anybody of any importance. They're not required to provide any information. And you've heard ample testimony today about, about just the, I don't know if it's uneasiness, fear, whatever you want to call it, of doing that. But I do know what a financial hardship it is. And then we hit the wall that probably caused the creation of the task force with NACDL, and I'm an NACDL life member, and with the Administrative Office for U.S. Courts that resulted in the creation of this committee. And that wall was sequestration. As we approached budget issues, we kept having more and more problems with the fact that the defenders and the panel couldn't go around the judges or get the judges to go to Congress to ask for the resources, the resources necessary to try these criminal cases in federal court. So when sequestration happened, it even pitted us one against the other. We had a terrible situation where the defenders got cut into the bone. And so Michael Nakmanoff and Ruben Khan, John Sands, I, I don't blame them, but they went to the Congress and they said, look, we've got to share this pain. And so they cut, they cut the rate that's already artificially low. They cut the rate for panel attorneys. And then it has, and, and that's with the history. And by the way, I was part of the group. We voted among the panel reps on the DSAG. We voted that we would take up to six months of deferral of our vouchers. Six months to let Congress do what Congress does. Because this had happened before. There was historical precedent. The judges didn't want that. No, 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 no. We don't want to do that. We'll cut the rate instead. And so the rate was cut, and then Congress, as it often, or it has in the past done, came to its senses and, and passed the budget and reinstituted things. And the, one of the only peoples who got left completely out in the cold in that is the CJA panel. They just didn't get reimbursed for those, that lost time, that lost hours. These small business people, these independent contractors that we care so much, they just took it in the face. Please try to do something about that. It would be wonderful. So that's voucher cutting, and that's the, the, the structure, the systemic issues. The final issue I want to talk to you about is something that uh, you brought up, Mr. McBride, and that is parity. Parity is what it's all about, a level playing field. I was trained by both of these individuals on either side of me that, that a good lawyer can try either side of a case. Well, not without the resources you can. If you go into court and you don't have a smart board or you don't have the access to it or you don't have the proper technology or you don't have the uh, ESI capability that Mr. Esper talked about in terms of discovery, you're just in the ditch. You're not dealing with parity. So what we did at the, the DSAG is we said, and, and other good lawyers, by the way, for those on the committee who are on the courts, think of those lawyers who may have come in front of you or historically have come in front of you judges and said, I, I need to know what the prosecution spent on investigation. I need to know what the prosecution spent on discovery. I need to know what prosecution resources were assigned to this case so I can do my budget. Very good judges, I would respectfully suggest, just don't deal with it. It's just part of discovery. It's just, it's just not what the court believes it's there to do. I've never in my career had a judge try to force the U.S. Attorney's Office to up the amount that they spent on any particular case. So that's at the local level. At the national level, we don't get, the, the AO and the Defender Services Committee does not get any data from justice. We, we, are, we are trapped into comparing a system for parity against another side that we don't even know what resources are being spent. I suggest to you that's 
fundamentally wrong. I accused them before of having some kind of good old boy agreement where they just wouldn't ask each other because they go to separate congressional committees. I don't know that that's the case. They're a bunch of well-meaning, wonderful people. But I do know it's fundamentally wrong not to compare. So what are the cost comparisons? You judges have seen these missives from the AO. Let's try to get cheaper investigators out there without looking at what the prosecution spends. Let's try to get cheaper experts. Cheaper experts? The only question in the system is what does the prosecution spend for experts? That's the only question. If you're looking at parity, the, anything else just compares us to each other and finds the guy that got the cheapest expert and let's all use that expert. And that's not really, I don't think, the direction that we want to go. I think you all are at a crossroads. I commend you for your service. I thank you very much um, for it. And I'd I, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Who's driving this? Why do I want to say, may it please the court? <laughs> well, I'm not from the Western District of Texas. And I'm not even from Texas, but I'm close enough. So. I'm going to give you all a perspective from uh, not just simply Arizona. I'm going to change the, the way I was going to approach this because I think it may be helpful for you all to get war stories. I don't like to use that term. But incidences that have happened to me or my colleagues in the District of Arizona concerning two areas. Uh, particularly in terms of the CJA programs. So this is, um, I guess, real world down on, uh, down on the uh, uh, actual practice of law where I uh, am the CJA rep. I, I'll just say this parenthetically. I've had the opportunity to be a prosecutor for almost 30 years. So I'm looking at my 10 plus years as uh, defense counsel from the perspective of what I've seen available to prosecutors and the resources that they have and that we do not. My two main uh, ideas to convey to you all is that the budget is too low for what we do, both for ourselves in terms of our hourly reimbursement, and it's too low for the support function that we seek to help us in our cases, be it experts, paralegals, investigators, whatever. As I see it, the consequence of a budget that is too low is that the appearance, and perhaps the reality, is inadequate representation. Not one of us would ever admit to that. Yet I think in any given case, the fact that a lawyer did not have enough investigative resources or the right, quote, expert, or enough paralegal help to put together a motion makes you feel, makes us feel somewhat insecure. I have not come to the point where I agree with what I've heard that this may lead inevitably to a waiver of trial. In other words, instead of taking the case to trial, we'll punt. However, I can see, I can see that as being a potential possibility. So now you've got ineffective assistance of counsel. My second point that I wish to make to you all is that I do think the judges on the district court level are too involved with what we do. They approve attorney vouchers, which I think is a systemic issue. There is cutting by some, and I will perhaps in terms of whatever questions you all want to give me, respond to that. They're involved in approving the appointment of our experts. And in a moment, I'll tell you why I think that's a problem. Well, I'll, I'll say it right now. Because judges are involved in what we do in terms of our pay and the appointment of experts, we have attorney-client and work product privilege issues 
that in effect, I'm not saying we waive them when we talk to judges about issues, but sometimes I believe we cross over the line. In addition, I think it's true, and it has been true probably for several years, that judges do not participate in settlement conferences. They do not get involved in the disposition of cases in the sense of you sit down like I have had the experience in the state court, and a judge will participate in that effort. Judges in the federal uh, courts do not want to do that because they want to avoid a conflict. Um, yet it's ironic to me that they are participating in my thought processes and inherently have a conflict when I have to talk about why do I need a given expert. So the solution as I see it is that this function should be taken away from the judges. Our budget, our CJA budget, in the sense of, I should say, approval, should be handled by a court executive. I'm not willing to say it should be handled by somebody totally independent. I understand that the judiciary has a budget, budget and it needs to control it. So I do not have any problem with someone who is a court employee handling the <coughs> the approval of vouchers, the approval of experts. I think it also will take away from judges what I think must be an extremely frustrating experience. To sit there hour after hour, and I know most judges do this, and they go over the vouchers. I think if I were a judge, I would rather be whatever <laughs> other things judge, judges do, but I sure wouldn't want to be reviewing the mathematical aspect of a voucher and then trying to decide did he really do this kind of work such that he or she deserves this kind of remuneration. That's not something that I think judges really want to get involved with. I have heard others remark about the fact that there are district court um, executives who do this function. I was not aware of that, but I do know from my circuit experience in the Ninth Circuit, Peter Shaw is the commissioner, and Peter Shaw is the person who approves all the vouchers that go to the Ninth Circuit uh, for, the, for the CJA panel. But Mr. Shaw is fantastic. He does it quickly, he does it with dispatch, and if there's an issue, it gets I do believe it gets referred to one of the judges who heard that case but it is resolved, your voucher is resolved quickly. I understand they're not nearly as complex in many cases as district court vouchers, but nonetheless, um, I believe that that is a workable function. That is a court executive. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about experts. Um, we have had the situation where judges will ask us, why do you need this expert? If we put down an emotion that is sealed why we need the expert, and we take pains in order to say specifically, these are the things that my neuropsychologist will look at. These are the areas, the accounting records that the forensic accountant will look at. And the reason why I think a forensic accountant is helpful, for example, is because I think that the forensic accountant can tell me the flow of funds such that if the conspiracy began on X date, and we've got flow of funds that go before that date that are allegedly monies that are laundered, then perhaps I have a theory of a defense and approach. Now, um, sometimes I feel that in that process, I'm giving up more than I should be. One reason is, is suppose the forensic accountant comes to me and says, as has happened to me very recently, Dave, we're on a first name basis. Dave, you, uh, your client, I'll put it this way, is the money laundering is there. All of these transactions are inconsistent with his business. They are loaded with smurfing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in an indirect circumstantial way, he is guilty as whatever. And, and the feeling is that having been paid to have Mr. X give me this information, and then we come to trial or we come to uh, the uh, 
end of the case and we don't have a trial. And the judge must be sitting there wondering what I wonder what happened to the $4,000 worth of forensic accounting expert money that I paid. Hey, must have been that it didn't work out. And so I feel like I've given up something that I'd rather not give up. I believe judges are fantastically good at making the intellectual compartmentalization that it would take to look at this type of issue and not come to an adverse conclusion. But nonetheless, we are all human. And sometimes I feel like even the best of us inevitably come to the most logical conclusion or the most, in my case, adverse conclusion. Another thing that I have seen happen in uh, that goes along with this. It isn't really experts. Um, I have a colleague who um, wanted to call witnesses from out of state. Um, many witnesses from way out of state, let's say the East Coast. And as a consequence, that would have been expensive. Travel, uh, upkeep, it was a long case. The defense didn't know when it was going to go, so they would be, uh, witnesses would be uh, in Phoenix for a long, long time. And there was a discussion between this attorney and the judge as to why these witnesses were needed, how many witnesses were needed. Um, so I believe that the discussion went something like, this person will say this. This person has this defense. This is where the alibi comes in, or something like that. Um, so I, I don't think that that would have been would have made me very comfortable. Um, part of the expert issue has to do with budget. I give you a, an example of something that, unfortunately, um, goes back to our 2009 standard, if you will of what our experts are charged, and we are still working off of that. One of the things I've tried to do is to come to 2015 budgetary rates. Forensic accountants, for example, are $250 to $450 an hour in my district. A, ne a neuropsychologist is at least $250 and probably more. A good investigator, a good white-collar investigator, is not $55 an hour. My best investigative resource. They are terrific. They charge more for their time and retain cases than I charge as a CJA lawyer. So their response to me recently was, we're on a first name basis, Dave, we're not going to take as many CJA cases anymore because we can't afford it. Um, let me go to the budget for experts. Um, we're getting our budgets cut both, and by the way, I don't mean to say this is, perhaps I'm implying it, it'd be unfair to say this is systemic wide. This is episodic. And what I'm giving you is what people have told me. I don't mean to uh, say this has all happened to me. Um, their rates of pay are being cut back to the 2009 level. I will give you something that has happened to me I will show by my own research what expert Y in my community will charge. And I'll try to get three or four experts and they will give me their charges and I'll put in their uh, curriculum vitae. And I will ask the court, could you now approve this over what is in the, our rate, our standard rate for 2009? And some judges will do that and some will not. What is the end result for the expert who will not get that rate, that expert will say, um, I can't do it. I just can't afford to do it. Or they may do it, and as I have heard one of my colleagues say, that person paid the difference. A lawyer paid the difference. Um, and now I'll give you another example of, of um, paralegals. And then I'll stop on this. I think most of us have a retained paralegal. I don't see how any legal practice in this, this day and age could ever function if the lawyer just tried to do it 
uh, with his sister-in-law or whatever. It just cannot be done. I pay my paralegal a straight fee. Whatever can, she can be compensated for, for CJA work, I will do that as well. If her fee gets cut for the CJA case, we book her hours, and if that has happened, then I will make up the difference. Because I don't want to have a disgruntled employee. I don't want to lose this paralegal. But that has happened, and um, I think I'm not the only one that that, 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 that has happened to. Here's an irony for us, at least in my county, which is Maricopa. The uh, again, I'll go to the forensic expert, who is who really is a very uh, good friend of mine. And I um, asked him, "Do you work for the county?" This is a long time ago. He said, "Yes." He works for both the county prosecutor and the three different public defender organizations that we have in Maricopa County. They pay his standard rate. He doesn't work for the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I know from the reputation of the experts that the U.S. Attorney's Office gets that they are getting paid a lot more than what we're budgeting for in terms of our own expert witnesses. I'm going to leave off on that and try to go to a second area of and that's the rates of compensation for the lawyers. Um, I think it's it, at $127 an hour, going off of the recent survey that was done by the administrative offices, well, one of their functions, if, if the overhead that the average G, CJA attorney has is $84, and I don't know how, that may be comparing a little bit of apples and oranges. But if you want to just go with that as a general average, it comes out to about $43 an hour in terms of what a lawyer would clear on a CJA case. Um, I, uh, it's a little hard to project what that means in terms of an overall income if one does 800 hours of cases, 500, 400, whatever it is. And my gut tells me, though, that that's too low. I'm not so sure that it's going to discourage people from doing this kind of work because truth to tell, it's fantastic. Anybody who likes, the fe who likes trial work and who likes the process uh, would want to, in my estimation, be in federal court. I don't think there's any better place to be, and I'm not here to make it glorified for the people sitting in front of me. That's just my experience of practicing for as, as long as I have. I do think what it does is it causes people uh, to be discouraged and perhaps to go to other county function uh, I'm sorry other public defender functions that we have in my county and spend more time doing those cases uh, what it has done for others is to make us go out as perhaps we should and seek retained cases in any event it just um, it, it seems to me that that is a very small uh, price to be paying for the quality of legal defense that people expect. Uh, I'm not going to talk about budget. I think, a lot, I mean, the budgeted cases, complex cases. I, I was sat through y'all's uh, questions for the last panel, and I think a lot of that, those questions were answered in just the same way I would answer them. And, and I don't mean to loop back, but I realize I forgot one one episode that I think is important to discuss, and that is discovery. The United States Attorney's Office has now gone, um, oh, board isn't viral, that's not fair. They're, they're, they put their discovery into disk and, and computer format. We are required to come up with hard drives, which means we lay out whatever a hard drive costs these days, $100, $150, out of our pocket. We won't see compensation for that until the end of the case. These are complex cases. In many instances, they have done a great job in trying to index their cases. 
In many instances, the really good AUSAs will say, here's where your client is in the discovery. I'm a little apprehensive about relying on indexes and relying on where somebody who is on the other side of the equation to tell me where to go to look for the salient parts of my client's defense. Moreover, I think that is to some extent an approach that perhaps some of the judges have taken in terms of looking over a voucher that has a lot of time given over to discovery. The response given by us is, how else do we know where our defense lies if there is a defense in the first place? And how, what do we tell our client? You, if you're going to sit down with a client, particularly in a complex case, who has a brain that is the white, some white collar type mentality, if they think they can fool you, they will. And you'll wind up spinning uh, your feet and wasting resources and perhaps coming out with a bad result, a worse result. You need to be prepared. And yet, I think sometimes the feeling is, is that we're way overextending ourselves in terms of the analysis that we do in discovery and the time we spend. I would have my paralegal sit down with me, as she has done, and my client, once I figured I knew where the case was headed, and say, OK, Lorraine, you do this. You know how to work the computer. At, at 45, I think it's $45 an hour. And yet, uh, there are times when I think that that is still too much time for a judge to approve. So um, perhaps I'm a little more pessimistic than some of the others who have given you their views in terms of how the CJA program is run. Um, but that is my perspective from having done it 10 years. I've been a CJA rep now for, I think, three years. Um, and I do want to finish by saying it's, it's always been a pleasure for me to go to a judge and talk to the judges in my district. I think they are uniformly open to listening. But I think we also have issues that, because of the way the system is run, need to be changed. And so I've given you my views and what I think ought to be done. Thank you. McBride, we'll start with you. Thanks, Judge Cardone. Um, I'm uh, not sure where to start. Uh, real smorgasbord, and, and thank uh, each of you for your your uh, your testimony. <coughs> and um, wish we had you know more time than uh, uh, than the clock says. But I'll, I'll start with you, Judge Garcia, just to go in order. Um, and and if I could just start with the issue of um, of uh, independence of the of the CGA program. And earlier today, we heard from the, the president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Mr. Morris, um, and, and this is a report that, that the NACDL put out a couple months ago. And I'll just read two sentences from it. it it's really just sort of a theme that's baked into this report, and you've, you've heard um, you know, some of your fellow panelists speak to this. But uh, this organization, with I think 9,000 members uh, across the country, uh, concluded that the defense function must be insulated, the CJA defense function must be insulated from the pervasive involvement and control by the judiciary. At the trial level, the appointment, review, and reappointment of CJA panel lawyers should be overseen by a committee of lawyers knowledgeable about and committed to indigent, indigent defense, and not by district court judges who often have a much different focus, interest, and background. So that's a pretty strong statement. Um, as somebody who spent most of my career in DOJ, I spent very little time thinking about these issues. Um, and so those words kind of pop off the page to me as sort of almost a layman coming to this. I'm just curious, from your perspective, Judge, you've been at this a long time. You know, do you, what is your sense about the current um, role of, of the judiciary in the oversight, I'm using air quotes, but the management of CJA? Do you think, on balance, it's, it's a good thing, a terrible thing, uh, about in the middle? Do you think there are any you know, improvements or changes that should be made? I agree with the statement made. I think the judiciary, I may get in trouble with my colleagues somewhere in the world, and I may need a marshal or two to help me. <laughs> um, I think the judiciary should have very limited effect, or rather impact, 
or involvement or role in the process, especially in the budget. Um, we get to determine the amount of a fee for an expert and the like. We make no determination with respect to the prosecution's budget, and nor should we. Therefore, I see no need, or I don't see the, the rationale, why we would involve ourselves in any part of the budget dealing with the defense. Um, I just don't see that. And uh, in terms of selection of the lawyers, I suppose we could get some input uh, from, well, the prosecution, but like our U.S. attorney mentioned, then we could run into some serious conflicts. Um, I just don't see, I would hope that the time in the future, whether near or in distant, um, or judges, you know, the idea in the 21 years that I've been on the bench, I've never denied or rather reduced a voucher. On one occasion, I had a question where the, uh, where the clerk in the clerk's office brought to my attention that she thought this was a little excessive. That, that issue I referred to a magistrate judge who conducted an informal hearing to gather all the necessary facts and I think revised the amount but not substantial. I don't want to consume my time in my chambers looking at a voucher and whether this lawyer, if the voucher indicates that the lawyer went to see his client at a detention facility three times, I'm not going to consume my time and make a judgment call and say, well, that lawyer didn't really need to go see this client three times. He should have gone two times, or he should have gone one time and then cut his money off. Um, how would I know? How would I know whether he needed three times or two times? What am I going to do? Bring the lawyer in and ask him, okay, why did you go the first time? What was the necessity of going the second time? And why did you go the third time? Couldn't you have resolved those issues the second time? That's going to take my time, and I'm going to interject myself and try to tell the lawyer, well, you could have done it differently. That's none of my business, as far as I'm concerned. So. Mr. Durbin, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, your, your thought about that. The, the, the other uh, part of this report that uh, was discussed earlier today is there's a portion from a, um, a congressional committee report in 1970, I think the last time the CJA was, was amended, and the Congress said, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially, you know, the notion that uh, the Federal Defender Service has to be uh, under the judiciary is as wacky as if the Department of Justice, you know, was under the judiciary. It just doesn't make any sense. There, you know, there should be sort of a, a symmetry there that they're officers of the court, but not necessarily, they don't necessarily work for the court. Again, I, I spent very little time ever thinking about this in the four years I was United States Attorney, but just curious if in getting ready for this uh, this 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 hearing or just your your you know uh, two plus decades if if you have any you know conclusions about just as a matter of organizational behavior uh, or, or or the org chart where the federal defender service should be well you you accurately observe I have not spent hours and hours thinking about this um, but it it does but but I but I've had a lot of experience with management over the last 20 years. And it does not make a lot of sense to me that the defenders are part of the U.S. courts, uh, which, which raises the question, where ought they to be? Um, and and I, I don't want to uh, get in trouble with the Department of Justice. <laughs> But a couple of thoughts come to my mind, and I'm, I'm sure they're not unique to me, and I'm sure that you all will think of them yourselves if you haven't already, but one of them is the danger of creating them as an independent agency, in my view, is then you've got defenders of criminals who are now going to go to Congress to try to get a, a budget. And if you think you've got budget problems now when you're within the courts, my guess would be 
just watching the way the Congress works and watching, for example, Planned Parenthood for the last several months, if you have the wrong case that's in the public at the time that the budgeting process is most heated, um, the defenders may find themselves all alone trying to figure out how to, how to get funding. One of the things that, that I've mentioned to, to Mr. Conbury, he, he smiles wryly at me when I say it, but you know the defenders are involved, as are we, in the justice process. There's a whole lot of stuff in the Department of Justice that I don't, I can't tell you what it is, I don't have anything to do with it. Um, so far as I know, um, we work at odds at various times. I don't know why you couldn't put the, the defenders under one of those parts of the Justice Department that has initials that I don't know what they stand for. OJP, DMJ, MJD, whatever the heck it is. Um, you, could, you could create walls within the department, um, put them over under the Associate Attorney General, for example. Does anybody know what, what all that office does anyway? I'm not sure. Um, but there are ways that you could, you could structure it. Um, and then they would be part of the Department of Justice budget. Um, and, and, and I just throw that out. There's probably other ways to do it. I'm not sure justice would leap on it. I know that most defenders would probably not leap on it. Um, but at least you're taking it out of the courts who are the referees. And, and what you've got is the referee who's also in charge of outfitting, budgeting, keeping track of, monitoring, apparently vetting, and deciding whether the players should even play in some circumstances. And just from a sort of a, a logical standpoint, that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And knowing the little that I do about what judges do, um, it, it wouldn't surprise me that that falls pretty low on their list of priorities. Um, and also, as I've pointed out in my written testimony, I, I suspect that part of the, the parity problem with experts is, you know, when you're in a position for a period of time, you learn to think from that perspective. I learned to think from different perspectives as I moved through the office, and that's sort of what dominates me. Judges are not thinking in terms of how advocates approach a case. And so the thought to me that a judge is deciding what kind of expert would be needed at the front end of a case where the judge doesn't really know what the facts are, shouldn't really know what the facts are, doesn't know what the issues might turn out to be, I'm not sure how a judge could reasonably make that kind of determination of, oh yeah, you need this kind of expert, um, and it should cost you no more than X. I sign expert um, authorizations all the time, not for the criminal side, interestingly, for the civil side, and I'm amazed at how expensive it is absolutely stunned at how expensive it is. And, 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 and I'm not in a position, I don't have the knowledge where I sit to say, this expert is too much, except every so often there's one. We've been signing $45,000 ones and one comes across for 90,000. I go, what? Why is everybody else 45,000? But beyond that, it's a, it's a very ham-fisted, very crude sort of review. Um, and so it, it makes, it just makes sense to me that that's not something that should logically or practically be placed on the table. Back to Rucker. I'd like to follow up on that and ask you, uh, if from all of you, uh, what your thoughts are about uh, changing the structure of, of CJA. Mr. Eisenberg mentioned uh, maybe a court executive like Mr. Shaw that we have a appellate commissioner in the Ninth Circuit. We've heard from other people that perhaps it should be under the federal defenders. Uh, maybe something like what the FJC is or the Sentencing Commission. But I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts about that or any other ideas you have to, to take it away from the courts. Okay. <clears throat> um, a couple of things. One, I suggested to Richard that we put it under Homeland Security for a better budget position. <laughs> That we, border security. We would finally get the resources that we need to, to try the cases. How about, how about the Pentagon? The Pentagon. There you go. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. That, that's an interesting example, Dr. Rucker, of, of uh, because I have experience there, I know that the entire process takes place within the military. You have the judiciary, the defense, and you have the prosecutors. 
and they have separate chains of command. And the only place it comes together, it, it doesn't really come together, but at the very top in the appropriation, the appropriation comes over and it's, it's split up basically to where it's needed. There's no con, I can tell you, there's no conflict in the field. There used to be in the bad old days, you'd have what they called command influence. And, you know, when you didn't have those separate chains of command. Uh, when I was a young lawyer, uh, you may remember it at the Brooks Army base when they had the, the scandal of the testing, urine testing back in the late 70s and had to throw out uh, thousands of uh, uh, Article 15's non-judicial punishments that were following individuals around for positive urinalysis testing. Well, the young defense lawyer that, that just, just blew up that whole system was Lindsey Graham, okay? Captain Lindsey Graham uh, was the lawyer who did that and did a fantastic job as a defense lawyer. I worked with him on cases on the other side when he was the regional uh, prosecutor in Europe in the 80s. Um, one could make an academic argument, a very strong academic argument, that we are moving more and more to a European type administrative system. Trials? Come on. What trials? Uh, generally speaking, the Western District of Texas in the San Antonio Division with its 1,700 or so many filings had 12 trials last year, 12 criminal trials. Trials are at an all-time low throughout the whole system because the guidelines punish you for a trial. There, there are different things that are built in where people are not going to trial. So the administrative process becomes the only process that people know in the system. Hence the importance of plea bargaining in the system and that type of thing. So in terms of resources, whether or not you use a separate entity that, the, as the Prado Commission suggested, whether or not you use the federal public defenders, and I'll stop there for a second because I have mixed emotions about that. I love the federal public defenders, but if you do that, there's got to be some independence. We're not joined at the hip. We have different interests. These very sophisticated individuals who testified in this panel, who's going to adjust the percentages? Who's going to determine what percentage the panel gets of cases and what percentage the defenders get? Because that has a lot to do with budgeting. Are you going to have a board of directors? I suggest to you that you look more to the community. In San Antonio, we're blessed to have a very collegial atmosphere. And we have a panel classification committee that I'm on, that the judge is on, that we have lawyers from the community that are on to do the selection of the panel and do those kind of things. But within the San Antonio Bar Association, we also have a federal courts committee. And the judges are members of that committee, the judges. We have civil lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers. We have um, the, the, the hierarchy of the Bar Association and the hierarchy of the Federal Bar Association. I cannot tell you, and, and representatives, in fact, I believe the, fir the chief of the, of the uh, criminal division, city chief, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. We get more problems solved there in that community-based meeting, whether you think of it as a board of directors or whatever you think of it. I, I, I want to, and I'm sorry if this answer was so long, but if you do nothing else, if this if this doesn't get the traction that, say, the Prado Commission report didn't get, if it's treated in much the same way, for goodness sakes, rep rep resent, recommend to your colleagues to undo the horrible decision to demote the Defender Services Office. To, when they stripped the Defender Services Committee of judges from, with budget authority and, and to a certain amount of authority, policy, Authority General. That, that's what soured, that's what really tilted the whole independence problem. That was our board of directors. Those were judges who were on the committee that, of judges that were, that, who would recommend policy changes and who would deal with the budget issues. And we were developing and maturing our relationship. I would say it's only been within the last five or six years that we've had joint meetings of the Defender Services Advisory Group and the Defender Services Committee of the judges. Oh my gosh, we were, progress was being made. 
And in the, in the midst of that progress, the judges decided to strip their own committee of the authority to continue to run the program. What a terrible, terrible mistake that's been. Uh, doctor, I think um, the idea behind the public defender becoming involved in reviewing vouchers creates a problem, at least in a district where you have many conflicts. In other words, our panel is so big because we have a lot of cases and the, and the uh, public defender's office can only take one defendant per multi-defendant case. So what would happen is there's, uh, I would think that whoever does review the voucher in the PD's office wouldn't have any connection with a particular case. But I feel a little bit uneasy about that process. Um, also, I think it's being, a, it's, that review would be done by a, uh, someone who is um, a co-equal to me rather than someone who is, whom I think should, I, I should feel is more in control of the overall budget. I think there's, um, we're talking about two different budgets. To go to Congress and ask for money, I don't think any defense counsel would be doing that. I think that's the judicial branch of the government, and to segregate the monies for CJA within their budget. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. Just like I don't have any problem with a district executive, like a circuit executive, reviewing my voucher. I just don't think the judges should be doing it. I also think that the district executive, that methodology could be set up so that there is a, an appeal. But I have a feeling that with someone who knows what they're doing, who's been a defense attorney, and who's perhaps done CJA cases at some point or another, you're going to wind up with a lot less misgivings about this whole process. But we have, currently, we do not have an appeal process built into the system. Yes, if I may, I'd like to uh, concur in um, our U.S. Attorney's comment. That is, the idea of having a separate entity out of, um, and having that entity go to Congress to lobby for lawyer fees, uh, given the, the rhetoric that we hear out there in the community about immigrants and immigration, well, Congress is not going to appropriate a whole bunch of money for lawyers to go out and defend uh, immigrants. I, I concur in Mr. Durbin's comment that perhaps the idea of placing the structure within the DOJ and build a tremendous firewall uh, might be the solution. But to have a separate entity and then have them go fend for themselves from monies, uh, I've never been a member of Congress and not likely to be, but you don't have to be. You just read what's happening out there in the world. And um, I don't think it, it's, it doesn't look well to have a separate entity. Ms. Ralph. Judge Garcia, you were talking earlier about the fact that you don't believe that the, the court or judges should have any control or any say over the budget of the Federal Defenders Program or the CJA program. I want to ask you about staffing. When you spoke just a few minutes ago, one of the things you talked about is that your district is the busiest district in the, in the country. And that what you really wanted from this study was to get more resources. And I, I couldn't help but think about the work measurement study that was done uh, by the Federal Defender Program or mm -hmm. of the Federal Defender Program, if you will. And in that, as a result of that study, I think the folks who did it also recognized how busy your district was and the fact that you needed more resources. And they recommended that and authorized that the defender's office in your district receive 25 more employees. Mm -hmm. Some of them um, would be uh, attorneys, obviously, assistant federal mm -hmm. defenders, based on how many the, the federal defender thought they needed. And as you may know, the Fifth Circuit has indicated that they will not give them any. So my question is, is do you believe that judges should be involved in the staffing of federal defender offices? No. And is that something that you or your colleagues have been able to address with your circuit in, 
in an effort to try and convince them that mm -hmm. the resource, first the study gets done, which takes, I don't know, a year and a half, then the determinations are made, goes all through the judicial mm -hmm. conference um, levels to get approved, right. and then at the end, still nothing happens mm -hmm. to assist your district, the, the uh, folks who can't afford counsel in your district, or your courts. Uh, to be quite candid with you, I've not had a discussion with any of my colleagues in the district. Um, I am soon to be the chief judge of the district come um, January, and I'm contemplating of, um, of forming a committee of judges to undergo a review of these all these issues so that we can come as a district and let this commission know what our thoughts are, especially from a huge district like ours. Mr. Conway, I'd like to ask you a question if I can yeah, ask another absolutely. question. We heard from one of the judges in your district yesterday who indicated that he had never cut a voucher, or if he had, maybe maybe he looked at it one or two or something. It was unclear. But mostly he kept saying he's, he's never had any problems with vouchers. And it became clear that what he was talking about were vouchers that were under the case maximum. Anything that was $9,900 or less, he had never had a problem with. And yet when you look at the case maximum, it's a $9,900 voucher means that the attorney spent 78 hours working on the case. Yet we've consistently heard from CJA attorneys during these hearings, and you may have heard some of their testimony, that cases are becoming more complex. Certainly not all cases, but we've, we heard from Judge Garcia that there are very complex cases in your district, that there are fraud cases that are complex, especially in Austin and San Antonio, that there are sex offense cases that are more complex. And yet, judges seem to think that that case maximum is the high watermark. First, I'd like to ask you whether or not you think that's a, a fair number for a case maximum, and second, whether or not you believe that some of the voucher cuts that you're seeing in your district and or we're seeing nationally are a result of that case maximum? First, I think the case maximums are way too low, as are the maximum amounts for investigators and experts. Part of what we're talking about is $2,400 before you have to go to the circuit. Come on. In what district or division, rural or uh, urban, is that possible? With respect to the case maximums, the system is set up so that you have to go to the circuit after that amount. So the individuals are talking about the letters that they've provided. Well, the judge has to send the request to the circuit. So first you have to get through the district judge, and it would behoove you to provide that judge with a memo of why this case meets the requirements for going over that case maximum. If that judge doesn't do it, well, you're just out of luck. We don't even keep statistics on that. In the statistic generating administration uh, of, of the Office of U.S. Courts that we have, we can't tell you uh, what, what that means. That, that's just, it's rude, if nothing else. And we don't even give it back to the lawyers. We don't even report it to Congress. We don't even have the good sense to tell Congress that of all these cases, this many volunteer man hours get, were, were put on. It has to be pro bono work if it's not fraud. So I do all this pro bono work. And then, as Reuben Kahn was talking about, where under the waterline is the real problem. The culture that came up from that child to that teenager to that adult were and still remain professionals in the legal profession who want to assist the courts. This is not a bunch of greedy, grubby people that just want to make a buck uh, off of the system. These are highly qualified individuals, many of them solo practitioners. Uh, and it, think of them as independent contractors. If you want statistics or data, please go and look at any independent contractor attorney in the entire federal government. And if you can find one for $127 an hour, I sure would like to see it. But what I would like to see presented to in this report is what those numbers are. 
I have friends who've represented assistant U.S. attorneys who've gotten in trouble where the DOJ actually wants to come to their defense. Those of you who've been involved in prosecution know what a difficult area that is um, for the department. Okay? So they hire one of the best criminal defense attorneys and pay him $450, $500 an hour. The irony of that, by the way, folks, is not lost on us criminal defense attorneys. That when DOJ wants to defend an assistant U.S. attorney, it's more than willing to pay the going national, you know, the going rate for retained counsel. But when the system wants to defend someone who's indigent, they want it at $127 an hour, and you pay your own overhead. This spills off over into training, by the way, which I know in, in this particular, I know you're going to have seven meetings, I believe. Training. The Administrative Office for U.S. Courts in this maturing process now offers significant training. Uh, Bob Burke just retired. He was a fabulous director of training, put together numerous things, has opened up the federal public defender's training to panel lawyers. Opened up free tuition if you can get there on your own nickel and stay at a hotel on your own nickel and, and do that. And many people take advantage of that, but it's, it's patently insufficient. And I also heard from a, a previous panel member I want to impress upon the committee to suggest again those, those relationships between the, like the New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, the woman that, that testified earlier. The Texas, I'm the incoming president-elect president of the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. I'm not here testifying on their behalf, but I will tell you that if you join those individuals together, the Federal Bar Association, the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers, or the Pennsylvania Criminal Defense Lawyers, or New Jersey, and you work with the federal public defenders, you're going to get outstanding CLE work to raise the level of the panel. And I think that the difference is oftentimes just a perceived, not a real dif difference. You might ask the Administrative Office for U.S. Courts, that Harvard study that's touted about being so different, they don't like it themselves. And what I mean by don't like it is they don't think it was accurately done. And they don't think it adequately reflects who's either better or who's uh, more or less expensive. That unfortunately got brought out in sequestration in the, in the midst of this fight where we were uh, unfortunately pitted against each other um, and should not, in my opinion, be relied on for any such suggestion as to which is better than the other. Mr. Derby, could I just, your question to me raises two, two separate issues, I think. Um, and I don't have a, a stake in it, but one is a question of who, who, who approves or authorizes payments for CJA work. The, the other question that gets mixed into this is what should the amount of fees be. And I hear the, the $127 that Congress came up. I have no idea where that number would come from. I don't know what it's supposed to encompass. Um, as, as Mr. Connery has said several times, there's the, the AO for U.S. courts doesn't keep data from those vouchers. But you know, my first question would be, wait a second, what what is the what is the cost, what is the value of handling a 1326 prosecution to guilty plea. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a reasonable cost to that. I don't think it's $450 an hour. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the standard payment has been for that, but it, it seems that somewhere in the commission's work is delving into what are what what is a reasonable pricing for attorney representation. I mean, the, the, the medical profession has, has, has had the, the fee-for-service model and then modified to basically, you know, this is, this is the fee that you're going to accept from the insurance company for this kind of service performed. And I'm a little bit familiar with it because my father's been ill recently and I've seen more medical bills than I care to, to see. And I, this is sort of deviating from the, the point, but I have a hard time figuring out where the fraud is because if the hospital says we're charging $280,000 and it's settled for $64,000, I 
Well, I can't figure out which was the real, what was the real price here? Mr. Dubrin, I, I hate to interrupt, but, but let me ask you a question. As a judge who sees these cases, um, I hear what you're saying, but isn't what any defense attorney is doing in their case totally reactionary to what you're doing? I mean, you, you say, you know, let's take a 1326 or let's take a drug case. I see two, three, four superseding indictments. How is it possible for me to say, oh, this is a reasonable amount in any given case? Because I, I very rarely see two cases the same, even backpacker cases or, or you know, we, ha we talk about N-600s in, in illegal reentry cases. There is no way that I can look at a case and say, oh, this is just like the last one I had. It, it just doesn't happen that way. So when I hear your, 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 and I hear what you're trying to say, but it's something that we struggle with because I think Ms. Rowe's question is, we have this sort of figure that somebody came up with of $9,900. Right. But, but, but where does that come from, number one? And number two, you, as, as a uh, U.S. attorney, you would never be held to that standard. I mean, I understand you have a budget and you have to stay within that budget, but if you get a terrorism case, Nobody's going to tell you, oh, well, you got $9,900, and you better do the best you can with it. I mean, I, I, I'm just not understanding what you're... I don't, I don't disagree with that, but, I mean, I make $75 an hour, not including all the overtime I put in. Now, I don't have overhead, and I have some benefits that come on, on top of that, but, but I can put a dollar figure on what I'm making per hour. Um, now... I don't know how they came up with that number. I mean, I came up with it. I took my salary divided by 2,080, and I figured out what I'm making an hour. I'm going, $127 sounds pretty good. Um, I don't have overhead. I don't have to pay support staff, and all of that stuff comes out, which gets into the parity question, and I don't really want to go from that. I, I think my point was there ought to be some systematic look at what is the service performed, and historically, what is paid for that? I don't know what the answer is, and I don't, I don't see this as, from my perspective, this isn't a zero-sum game. They get more money and I get less money. That's not what the issue is. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of what's a reasonable compensation as opposed to, well, we're going to have a really complex case and the sky's the limit. It, the sky is not our limit either. I don't know what the limit is, but we, we, we don't have the sky as the limit. And you, know, you, you talk about parity and the cost of prosecution. I don't know how you figure that out. We spend a lot of time working on things that don't go anywhere. It doesn't get counted. We look at all kinds of cases and put time into them. Nobody ever gets charged. There's never a defense lawyer. It, does that get count, counted in the cost of prosecution? Um, I mean, I don't know where, I, I don't know how that parity issue is going to answer your question. I think, I think the issue is looking at what defenders do what are the kinds of things they need to do? What kind of leeway do they need to have? Who's going to oversee it? And based on what we've paid in the past and what the market is bearing, what should, what should the government be paying for that? And, and I think those are, in part, data-driven questions, and it isn't there. And the $127, like, like you say, it comes out of the air. Somebody said $127, that's what it is. I don't know what it's supposed to supposed to represent? Is it overhead, support staff, as well as lawyer time? I don't know if, I, I don't know how you tell whether that's a reasonable number. And, and as you point out, the $9,900, I don't know that that's a reasonable number. But I don't know how you find it unless you start looking at what is the, what is the practice in the industry and somehow quantifying it. We, we, do, we do have studies that indicate, and you've heard testimony today, about how difficult it is to find panel members. We have studies and data that shows that people who answer the surveys will point to the fact that the fee, that the inability to recoup their losses, so to speak, is a reason they won't take CJ cases. Also, I wanted to point out that in that most recent study of CJ panel representatives, and I'm not sure it's public yet, so I'm a little mildly uncomfortable with, with telling you, but it's 39.3% am I, am I, of CJ panel reps 
this, there were two surveys done, and it's a pretty significant amount of the CJA reps throughout the United States, and they reported 39.3% of individual panel attorneys, not just CJA panel reps. It was a sampling of just the, the, the line rank and file people reported that over the past two years, they have had a voucher, uh, non-capital or capital, reduced at either the district or circuit court level for reasons other than mathematical or administrative inaccuracies. So 39.3%, the, that, that, that exists. Again, we haven't kept the kind of data that anyone would want to know. And what Mr. Durbin is talking about, I do know some of the answer, and, and Chip knows this and other individuals, that there is a formula that Congress, that the judiciary went to Congress on, and Congress passed, uh, I guess, part of some budget act some time ago that put in a formula for the CJ panel rate. They've never followed it. So it should be $149 an hour. It was based on, by the way, surveys of overhead and increases and then and a margin of inflation, all those things that, that budget and, and uh, individuals do. The problem is, for instance, this past year, and this came up at the Defender Services Advisory Group, it was a hotly debated issue within the Administrative Office for U.S. Courts, and the judges in, in the Executive Committee and just simply decided not to approach Congress. For 11,000 CJA panel reps, the judges decided not to even approach Congress and ask for what the rate should be right now. Think about that. Who does that benefit? Now, they did it for our own good. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, but I don't feel very good about it, as you can tell. I, I feel like, and, and my limited knowledge of, of Washington, D.C. budgeting is that's silly. If, if, you, if you come in, for instance, some of the judges will go in and say, oh, no, no, it's okay. Don't give us any more than this. Just give us, in fact, you can, if you're going to cut us, cut us here or cut us there in the defenders or in, in the panel, um, oh, my goodness, I've sat through budget committee hearings with other departments that, and I've never seen a single one ask Congress to cut their budget or to say, well, yeah, this program's a little bit out of control, so, you know, feel free, you know, not to, to fund it. At a time, especially when the people out in the field don't even have the resources to get the job done. And, and so it's small wonder that, that there is concern out there among, and it's, it's a brewing, bubbling kind of thing that, we don't have the resources to get the job done. Judge Bolden. Um, my first question is for Mr. Convery and Mr. Eisenberg. So we've heard a lot of anecdotes and a lot of stories, and this is just our first hearing. <laughs> we've read a lot um, about voucher cutting. And one I heard today really I thought was alarming where a lawyer got their voucher cut because she wanted to charge, I thought she said, for writing to, um, or having the family write in and meeting with the family. And the uh, magistrate judge said, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna approve that. And by the way, you're not getting any more cases for me. Hmm. That was very disturbing. So we're hearing a lot of problems, but our task is to figure out is, how big is the problem? So to use your metaphor, is it, the, is it the tip of the iceberg or is it below the water? What's below the waterline? And you're sure what's below the waterline is judge, improper judge voucher cutting. I mean, your, your statements say, um, unwarranted voucher cutting remains a core problem with the administration and management of the CJA program. Uh, I think you use the word systemic. So looking below the waterline, and I'm asking the CJA panel attorneys this, are there any anecdotes? Are there any stories? Of, is there any conversation amongst your colleagues where um, judges are doing the opposite of improper voucher cutting? That is, um, some judges are saying, we trust the CJA lawyers so much, if they submit a bill, approved. 
Are there um, judges who um, agree and have concerns when they go into a courtroom and they see the U.S. attorney with all of their resources and say, Mr. C.J. lawyer, can we talk about resources and investigators for you and experts? Are there judges that do that? Um, are there judges who will call up as they're required to do under the guidelines and say, Mr. Eisenberg, I'm, I want to talk to you about you know, some, of your, some of your bills. Come on in, let's chat. And maybe a little bit is cut and maybe there's a, a discussion and a dialogue where Mr. Eisenberg says, you know what, Judge, you have a, you have a point there. Um, is there any um, anecdotes about CJA lawyers? Uh, and we heard one today about Citizens United charging for that. And I would say I, that had to be at least 100 hours to try to understand that case. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell one quick story that's going on in my district. I'm involved in the, in the criminal courts committee where a lawyer sent in a voucher, a respected lawyer, and he billed for reading one letter, two paragraphs from the U.S. attorney, and he billed five times for doing the same thing. So were there any stories about voucher cutting that was appropriately done by judges? Are there any anecdotes to that end, because that'll give us a better picture as to what lies beneath the surface. Oh, David. Uh, Judge, I can give you one, going to your last point, um, where three or four lawyers build so much in our district that it could not possibly have been humanly, could not have been humanly possible for them to have worked that many hours. And I'm sad to say, that's a apparently that's a real story. <clears throat> There's also been um, a story about lawyers building the very same thing on the very same case for the very same amount of hours, which theoretically is, would be impossible. To answer another one of your questions, there are judges who will respect what they see, and they will not lower the boom. They will not cut vouchers. Uh, I think they perhaps look at who's applying and by nature those judges, and I know because they have told me this, will say, I'm not interested in getting involved in this process. Not that they're abdicating it, but they don't want to get underneath what we say. And there are other judges who will say, if it took you that long to do something and you've given me the, uh, what do you call it, the list of cases that you, the Lexus Nexus will allow us to Xerox off and hand in with our voucher, pretty soon they will learn to trust that person. There are, on the other hand, judges who will uh, uniformly cut. And it's little, and, and I'm, from my own perspective and from others, others who have told me this, it's hard to say why. I am not interested in fighting over a relatively small amount of money for a variety of reasons. I have come to the conclusion, though, that maybe that conclusion is wrong. And maybe I ought to be, at least in my own vouchers, coming in and asking. The judges are very responsive to us. No judge will ever shut the door not pick up the phone because any one of us have, have called and, and want to talk about a voucher. However, when I've been told that you're not going to get the kind of money you want because it's just too much money for discovery, ask your client what he did, then you'll find out where to look. Go to the U.S. Attorney's Office and ask them and um, that happens, so, and it happens in complex cases. I've had the opportunity to be, even if my testimony doesn't seem so, fairly diplomatic for four chief judges as the guy in the middle, you know, the CJ panel rep between the rank and file lawyers and the judges. And the rank and file lawyers' complaints are division by division. We have one division that cuts vouchers all the time. 
for a variety of reasons, none of which make are worth really worrying about because they don't make a lot of sense. It's just the only sense I can make of it is it's kind of a budgetary tool. Um, you know, you go to see the family too much and, or you went. There's different reasons. It's a sliding scale of reasons. But in, in that same division, um, that judge has contacted me and had individuals who are going to the federal detention facility, panel members, seeing three lawyers at, at the same time and, and billing like for all three separately. You, you know, it, it, or people do that with parking. With they, there's an audit, by the way. There, there are audits periodically conducted by the administrative office for U.S. courts that will show you what those issues are that I think the, that you're talking about, Judge. But anecdotally, I, I know of two people who did a, a, uh, a federal uh, death penalty uh, habeas writ who weren't paid in over a year that, the, that the, the judge argued with them and didn't want to pay them for it. And they went to the chief judge who said, I don't, I don't involve myself with the decisions of other district judges. Because I'm not going to tell that other district. Sorry to interrupt, but we're back to antidotes about bad voucher cutting again. My question went to, is is that really a systemic problem? Or Absolutely. Can you, have, can you are there no stories about 39.3 percent ma managing vouchers? There's, it, it's just a problem. I think by and large, well, if if 40 percent, then in 60 percent of the cases, the judges are properly. One could say the judges are properly managing vouchers. Please don't get me wrong. I think the judges, by and large, do, within that systemic conflict that exists, they do a very good job of judging cases. I just simply think that in, in terms of resources, because the voucher cutting is also inter inextricably intertwined with experts and investigators, the budget for the thing. And then you come back and you have individuals. There's a case that's current that some of the committee members can tell you about out in San Diego where an individual tried a case. Um, the case was, I think the billing was $50,000, which in Texas would never happen in, in a million years. And, uh, and Judge uh, Real um, just said, it wasn't worth that, don't, don't pay it. Um, uh, the individual panel member is, is, a, is an African-American who's a very good person who absolutely tried the case. And everyone is snapping to and coming to their assistance, but there's no appeals process. So if that, if that stands, it's just, I don't know if the court could, if, if any judge would want to take a $50,000 um, shot like that, so to speak, or we'll give you $9,000 instead of $50,000. I know I'm not answering your question. I think the answer is self-evident. Yes, that... But I think fraud, waste, and abuse is a red herring. It's a big bugaboo. I'm perfectly willing, by the way, as a panel attorney, to undergo audit scrutiny, to undergo legitimate type voucher cutting for work that either wasn't performed. For instance, for those individuals who are over billing for billing three times for the work of one event, when the district judge called me as the panel representative and said, what should I do? I said, it's fraud. Prosecute them. Right? It's a pretty simple answer. Um, but if it's legitimate and, it, and it's righteous, and then I don't think my experience with a number of district judges is I'm not sure it, this is done in chambers, if you will. And I'm not sure that every judge burns the midnight oil working on these vouchers by themselves. And so that, and then, then it's done as many things are within chambers, and it reaches the judge, and the judge makes a decision. So, so my point, I don't mean to be redundant, but and I'll, I'll turn it over to Neil. But mm -hmm. my point is, are there judges who go, you know what? I don't want to burn the midnight oil. I trust Eisenberg, and I trust Convoy, and if they build a hundred hours, it's approved. Absolutely. Does that does that occur? Absolutely. In sure. your opinion, to what extent? I would say at least half the time, okay. at least, okay. if not if not more than that. It, it works. When I first went to the national or group, the Defender Service Advisory Group, and compared my experiences in the Fifth Circuit and the experiences I was aware of, like with the Southern 
district of Texas. You've already heard about the Austin not even having a panel, and you haven't even heard about the uh, McAllen and the division down there and, and issues and problems that are similar. But when I first went and I heard from panel attorneys in different parts of the country who were like, I love the current system. My judges, I, I get resources. They, they, they are good to us. They're collegial. They pay on time. Do, you, you know what I mean? That's, that, that, I think, in many places is the norm. The problem is that when judges change, it can change overnight. Judge, I think the the uh, answer to your question is the more complex, at least my experience, the more complex the case is, the more likely there will be a cut, and that there are individual judges who inevitably will not cut. It just depends on the circumstances of the case and the circumstances of the judge. McBride. Uh, this is a question for um, Judge Garcia and Mr. Eisenberg. And, and if I, I'm going to switch gears away from vouchers and um, organizational and independence, as important as those issues are. But one thing we're charged as a committee to do is to, is to make recommendations on to ensure best practices um, across an incredibly diverse landscape of, of uh, CJA uh, panels and FPDs. Um, Speaking again from from my DOJ experience, th that was a pretty easy issue for me. And and um, while maybe not as diverse as your district, Judge Garcia, I mean, in the Eastern District of Virginia, we had four divisions. It felt like we had four districts within one district. You know, Alexandria was terrorism and financial fraud. Richmond was public corruption and gangs. Newport News was all adoptive cases from the state DA because of problems with the, the local system and and Norfolk was armed export and and uh, you know healthcare fraud so I had no problem I, I spent no time worrying about how do I come up with a you know system that thinks globally and acts locally within the district I had full freedom and ability to move resources around and 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 the law enforcement agencies had priorities that really were targeted and dialed in on each of those divisions um, in your testimony, Judge Garcia, you, you, you encourage us not to, to you know, pursue a one-size-fits-all approach. We've heard that from many other witnesses the last couple days, but just wondering if, if, if you both um, could speak from, from your district's diversity perspective, Judge, and Mr. Eisenberg, you're an alum of three U.S. Attorney's offices, very diverse, and now you're in a diverse um, uh, per, uh, state, obviously. But what, what, what does that look like on the CJA side to come up with something that uh, – it tries to uh, apply best practices and and lessons learned and and some coherence while being flexible. Well, again, um, to be quite honest, um, in our district, I don't think we don't communicate with each division. We have we have seven divisions, but only six CJA panels in those six divisions. And the it, it would be wise to communicate with each other to find out what are our common problems between those six divisions and what are the unique problems for whatever, however many divisions there are. Um, the, the, I think the most crucial part that would be common would be uh, training of lawyers for all those divisions because whether a lawyer in San Antonio or Del Rio are representing a uh, a, on a 1326, uh, that should require the same kind of expertise and knowledge. Um, when you're talking about complex cases in Austin, San Antonio, that may require a heightened uh, level of expertise. That's what I would say. Well, I think the answer to your question is I would like to see a uniform approach, not so disparate that we become boggled and entangled in um, the minutiae of trying to operate on four or five different platforms or systems. I don't think it's impossible to do. After all, an indictment is an indictment. There are more complex indictments than others, and districts have more cases than others of the same nature. And I think what you find is that it's sort of, I'll take my district, we do a lot of border work in the Tucson division, and you know, reentry cases are legion. And it 
doesn't take a lot of, of um, there, there are not a lot of different approaches that one can take. You really need to know the background of the defendant and the, uh, his criminal history and where uh, she may have, uh, what function she was performing if her reentry is mixed with something else. But to go back to a big picture, I would prefer a uniform approach so we all have standards that we understand would be applied. And I still go to my basic idea that it should be handled by an executive and not a judge. I'd like to shift just a little bit. One of the things that I've heard over the last few years, and we've heard some uh, yesterday and today, uh, is that uh, the panel is aging, and I think that's an issue, and that we need to recruit new people and we need to train these new people. Uh, I, I was particularly concerned about, uh, in some of the big cases, uh, that we don't have the, the skills that we need among the panel attorneys, and I wanted to get some thoughts from you about how we can recruit new people how we can train them to work on these big complex cases and even like capital habeas cases. So I'd like to hear from the panel representatives about that and Judge Garcia as well. Well, if there's enough money, we can train enough lawyers. Um, that's one issue. Uh, it all comes down to a budget. Now, in some areas like Pecos, Texas or Midland, you're not going to have enough lawyers and you're not going to have enough lawyers in Del Rio. But and it requires money for adequate training, for enough CLE courses. Um, and um, I would imagine we could go to the present CJA lawyers on the panel to, to go out and recruit or suggest other lawyers or names of persons that could be uh, uh, encouraged to become a panel member. Uh, of course, there's so many discouraging factors in becoming a panel member. One is the rate of $127. Um, so I, I would um, imagine that it's a function of a budget in terms of getting adequate lawyers, adequate number, and adequate competence. One, one approach, uh, sir, might be uh, to have monitor, uh, mentors, I'm sorry. And to some extent, that's done in my district, but it's it's also done on a volunteer basis. We don't really have a mentor board. However, let's say you're getting a white collar case and you've never done it before, and it's tax or some other hairy thing. Uh, we can pair up an experienced attorney who has seen that kind of thing with a newer attorney, and you're donating the mentor is donating his or her services. They're not going to be put on a voucher, but that does happen. And I think it's relatively successful if you have enough people who are willing to do it. A second approach is to have a second chair, a second chair. So the new attorney becomes a, a second chair to a more experienced attorney. I don't like to use the term older, just more experienced attorney. And, that, and, and so you share the experience. Um, I don't know whether the, it all goes back to budget. I don't know whether the budget really allows for that. A third approach to take is that, uh, to some small extent, recruiting private attorneys for really uh, uh, complex cases has been done before. It doesn't give you, uh, they don't, they're not retained on the panel, if you will, but it might be uh, a one case answer to, we, gosh, we don't have enough attorneys in, in any particular type of situation. And the last thing is for people who have been around a while to go out and look for people who, I mean, I get calls all the time from people who want to join the panel. And um, they, they do go through a vetting process. Um, but I think most of the CJA reps are willing to steer new people in the right direction. But there is no, in my district, there's no organized program for this. <clears throat> my district is different. Of course. I, I want to break up my answer into both uh, mentoring or diversity and the panel itself. Um, I think if you look at uh, Federal Public Defender Rose District in Minnesota, in fact, I know for a fact, uh, you'll find a mentor program that's built into the plan. In the Southern District of New York, the then panel rep, Tony Rico, 
and some other individuals built in a mentor program into the CJA plan. Uh, the judges then, and the administrative office for U.S. courts actually, signed off on paying the mentees at kind of the investigator rate. Uh, what a wonderful situation. So again, through these national meetings and through the Defender Services Advisory Group, I found that's how I found out about it. I took it back to San Antonio. Then, um, then F Federal Public Defender uh, Henry Bemperat, who's now a magistrate judge, we put a plan together. It's in the West, the San Antonio Division. Our divisions have plans. Our district plan is like one sentence from 1976. It says, you know, you'll do the right thing and defend indigent cases. And then our different divisions have very specific plans, except for Austin, which still does things as it was done in the 1950s, 60s. Um, but diversity, one of the reasons we created that is we take people, many who have, who have no federal experience, but who are leaving the DA's office or have a lot of state experience. And we're able to, to, to select people and we're able to be judicious about uh, minority individuals, people of color, uh, 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 gender, all, all the diversity kind of things that this aging panel member wants to see come into the system. And we're able to reach out and put them with very good, very professional uh, people. Mostly it's the people who are on the panel classification committee. The, the chief judge in our district did it for a year. We did it for free meaning that the mentees did not get paid. Um, now we have, and I call to your attention, there's a standing order that pays the mentees, uh, but not for dual hours. So if we both go to the detention facility, only one of us can bill for it. And all of the mentors are fine with that. I know that in Federal Defender Rose system, I believe it's the, it's the fund, it's the non-appropriated fund uh, which is rather large in many, many districts throughout uh, the country that helps to pay for that program. Um, with respect to the panel itself, because we speak in such a large, diverse district, it's different in New Jersey or Rhode Island. It, it is different in all these areas, and that does need to be taken into consideration. In Texas, the, these divisions that the, I, when, when the soon-to-be chief judge was talking about that they don't communicate, um, they do things the way they would like to do it in El Paso or in Del Rio. It's, it's, if we have, we don't have a, in other words, a complex case cadre that can even go district wide. We have major arguments in, in our district, CJA arguments. We have, we have in the Del Rio division where there's so many cases, the district judge wants San Antonio panel members and needs them often to come down and try the cases. But even though the Judicial Policy and Procedures Manual says you're to get paid for travel within the district for your time and your mileage, that judge will not pay people until they come into her division. <coughs> no. Well, a, a whole body of judges argued and had committee meetings like this and decided in the policy and procedures manual that it was appropriate to pay people district-wide. I tell you that because then you can't, you, it, it, it makes it silly to have a, like a complex group in an urban area who's willing to go to the rural division for a complex case that doesn't have enough lawyers if you're not going to be paid for it and ultimately if your voucher is going to be cut. So that presents, and that takes place at the circuit level also. I highly endorse the defender's request that you suggest that there be choose or capital habeas units. This is another example when you're looking when you're looking locally, when the problem is more global than that or more regional than that. Uh, we had a terrible situation in the Western District of Texas where uh, a federal district judge invited someone from a cable, capital habeas unit in, I believe, Arizona or. California because they had the time and they had the resources to come but they didn't ask the then chief judge of the circuit and the lid blew off of, of the whole issue to where that judge under our current system that chief judge of the circuit felt like that her territory had been invaded 
by defenders who are doing capital habeas work. Um, I, I think we need to get, uh, I, I think we need to change that and get above it. She was absolutely correct, by the way, under the, the letter of the way things were done, but it just didn't serve the purposes of the program. I, I, I have a quick question because we're running out of time, but for you, Mr. Convery, and you, Mr. Eisenberg, because one of the problems the committee has had is we have tried to put our fingers on the CJA panel. I mean, it's what, 11,000 attorneys. You guys are our panel reps. We were trying to come up with an email list. We were trying to come up with some formal communication. How do we reach out? Um, how do we find these people? Um, we were told, well, one way is you follow the check, but we had to go to the Depart Department of the Treasury to get a list. Um, so my question to you, Mr. Eisenberg and Mr. Convery, um, you are, Mr. Convery, I know you're in a huge district, um, and I know you have a lot of attorneys just because of the, the nature of what goes on in Arizona. I want to know, as the district panel rep, as the district, how do you talk to all of your CJ panel attorneys? I have a list serve that has every panel member on it, and the public defender's office uh, adds to or subtracts as members leave or get added in. And along with that, I also have a telephone and address list of every uh, panel member, and if I don't have that, I can get it. So communication for me is... Not a problem. And if you need that information, I, I'm assuming you, I can get it for you. Um, it, my situation is similar, except for the Republic of, of Travis County in Austin, Texas, <laughs> where I, I can't communicate with them. Who would I communicate with unless I go look at who filed vouchers, you know, which you heard earlier, you know, within the last couple of years. Um, I either through the um, clerk's office, through the same system now, you know, the electronic system of appointments, if something is really significant that comes from the administrative office for U.S. courts, we have the chief judge or someone send it out. If other than that, I communicate with my panel through the federal public defender. So how, how is it that we're being told that we can't get a list? If you have a list, you have a list. I assume all panel reps have a list. Why are, why can't, when we ask for a list, why can't we get one? I, I wasn't aware that there was any policy against disclosing either the identity of a CJA lawyer or their, it's public, their points of contact are public. So I, I don't know. So if we were to reach out to the panel reps, you're saying they should each be able to give us a list? Uh, not, again, it's not a one size uh, fits all type thing. Judge, I think in some areas that's true. I think the best thing is that if you contacted the federal public defenders, in, in all except the district that doesn't have one, then I think you would have the best chance of trying to, to get that information. But having said that, I also believe when I heard about the committee wanting to reach out to the rank and file, I think that's a great idea. But I would also highly recommend that those people who are in communication with the, the panel rep um, in, in, on a pretty regular standard basis. And, and so anecdotally, at least, because the data doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. So anecdotally, in future hearings, it, it, if the panel members come prepared, you'll, be, you'll also get a little bit of that anonymity that we were talking about. But you will get uh, a vehicle to, to hear from as, as many panel reps as, as possible. Anything that you would like to say, Mr. Durbin, that you haven't had an opportunity to tell? No, I think I've covered the points that I can contribute to. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you all. I hope it's been helpful, um, and I'm grateful that I don't have your job. <laughs> Mr. Convery. Um, we're at that mature place where recommendations should come to, to make us cooperate with more, even more, in a partnership with the federal public defenders. I don't want to work for them. And those issues need to be addressed. But I absolutely love working with them. And I hope that we can find a way to get this within the defense function uh, and, and get a better independence with, but I'll take more resources e even at the expense of independence. 
these are uh, you know challenging times, and I know you have a challenging task ahead of you. We always must keep in mind that every defendant has a constitutional right to an adequate defense, and it ought to be given to him because that is his right. And I'm hopeful that this commission will crystallize the, the things that are necessary and important, not not just achievable, but what what must be achievable. And I'm hopeful to looking forward to reading your report. Uh, Your Honor, I've sat here for four hours, and what I've noticed is the attentiveness that the people on the panel have shown us and, and shown the people who come forward to testify. So um, I just want to thank you all for being here and getting this ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, we appreciate your being here. Um, as, as I've said to every uh, panel we've had, you know, you have to take time out of your schedules and get here. I know some for some of the travel has been difficult, but we very much appreciate it. We have six more public hearings. We would encourage you to go back to your districts and get people to give us information. That's what we need. We want. Um, and, and we have a website. It's called cjastudy.fd.org. Please, um, if you have any commentary or people that want to comment, we want to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.